Hey, my name is Corey Taylor with UCF, and I'm doing my presentation on trustworthy hardware at the identification classification of hardware trojans. So you can kind of tell I'm doing this presentation with my cell phone. So um, as it views in and out of me and the screen for the sake of your viewing pleasure, I'm going to move out of the way, and I'll be right here on the side, and you can kind of see the, the slides. So, so what's some background upon this topic? Um, well, hardware historically has been developed to be assumed free of malicious elements. <clears throat> it was assumed that no one would attack straight to the hardware, probably just the software. Well, this has changed due to a lot of factors, and the main one being outsourcing. Um, so why? Uh, basically, we have high demand for low cost and quick production. So for cost, time, and not only that, but a standard sometimes being needed, for instance, uh, 3D modeling or CAD design, you, you don't want to have three or four different software products. You want to have one. Um, save That saves companies time and money as well. So with the hardware production as well being produced and tested, outsourced, um, like you even mentioned, Intel is the last in, in country development <clears throat> at that um, scale of like 14 nanometers and stuff. So a lot of that outsourcing has caused kind of a, a trouble um, with that. And so not only that, but with the testing, because you have to have trustworthy testers and producers of your equipment. Um, so what are some of the primary concerns? There's intellectual theft, which could be like patents or even like movies and stuff. Um, there's military purposes, so you don't want to have like a something extreme like a missile failing on you or um, some of your military secrets being leaked out. And then, of course, there's personal information like pictures and um, social security numbers and stuff. So you need to plan for the inevitable because this dependence on third parties is going to grow because of that primary push, that demand for low cost and quick production. So let's go over the outline of this paper. There's the summary, uh, and that basically consists of the types of Trojans and Trojan taxonomy, which taxonomy just means classification. So in this case, the classification of hardware Trojans. Then there's the experimental preparation, and there's the outcome that they used in the paper. There's related works, um, which I'll get into. And then there's future works and conclusions. So what are some types of Trojans? Um, so there's hardware Trojans, right? Um, a basic hardware Trojan has the, the malicious alterations of hardware, and that could under specific conditions result in functional changes of the system or even failure of that system. Uh, so what are some different types? Well, there's, instead of just always being on, there's that time bomb Trojan, right? Um, which the time bomb Trojan disables a system at some future predetermined time or from user interaction. Like a user could press a key on a keyboard and activate a Trojan, and I'll get more into that too. Um, but one classification is a data exfiltration system. So Trojans don't necessarily just go in and just destroy equipment. They leak confidential information over a secret channel. And that could be as low level as like Morse code over a radio frequency or as something more uh, uh, exotic. So there's some low level methods, right? There's the HDL source code. Um, programmers like to do, or designers like to obfuscate um, their blocks and stuff. But then the, the hardware um, hackers or attackers could then just kind of look at that, right? Because then the blocks communicate in predefined ways. Um, so they just kind of look at the watch, uh, watch the buses, which is at the circuit design level. Um, so what about the IC layout? That's another layer too. You know, you can modify the masks. Uh, the leading pro microprocessors have about a billion transistors. So what if you had like a thousand malicious ones? Uh, it's really cost prohibitive to try and, and look through that under a microscope. Uh, and of course there's other methods too, like firmware. And if you kind of look here on the bottom right, there's a simple... A uh, very simple diagram shown in the paper about how a Trojan works on the hardware level. So initially the data would come through um, this encryption method and then would go out to the output, right? Uh, well, here you have a multiplex, so upon activation of the Trojan, the plain text data that's not encrypted goes through the Trojan and then just sends out, so it, it's uh, no longer encrypted, <coughs> which is bad. So. <clears throat> what is Trojan taxonomy? And I kind of looked at this paper and I kind of saw that as a proactive defense. Um, <clears throat> and the best defense is a, a good offense a lot of times. Right? So what does this do? This enables a study of their characteristics. Uh, and in doing that study, you can now detect a lot better those Trojans. You can mitigate 
um, some actions, right? And then you can have some protection techniques um, prepared for that. Um, because you don't, you don't want to just have it happen to you and then get ready. You want to be proactive. You want to get ahead of the game. And there's benchmarks to serve as the basis for comparing countermeasures as well. Um, <clears throat> and so those benchmarks need to be developed and need to be set because you need to have something to compare it to. And then there's goals set by this paper. So the goal had, uh, paper had two goals. First is coverage. So they need to classify all potential Trojans, um, not only ones that are known today, but ones that aren't. Uh, the potential ones, so they have potentially none outside this taxonomy listing. And there's resolution, which is the distinguishing of Trojan differences and the required countermeasures, uh, which is pretty straightforward. So this is that classification, that taxonomy that they were talking about. We'll get a little bit more into depth into these two on the left here in a second. There's the insertion phase, which um, is where that occurs, and then the abstraction level, which is where it actually happens at, right? And then there's the activation mechanisms, which I talked about earlier, like the timing, right? I mean, is it going to be time-based? Or is it triggered for some kind of physical condition like temperature? Um, or is it just always on, like as soon as you have the device, it's always on? <clears throat> and so what are then the effects, right? They can change the functionality of the system, downgrade the performance, leak information out, or do a denial of service uh, attack. And then there's, of course, the locations where they identify as well. Like you can locate the processor or I.O. or the clock, right? Um, so this is that two um, levels I was just talking about. The level on the left, A, here, that's the insertion phase. And these are where the alterations take place. So you have the specification phase there, uh, and that's where you can potentially change the timing requirements. Design phase, uh, which, you know, you can have a, a standard cell library infested with Trojans. Um, you can have a power supply and grid failures in that fabrication phase, the testing phase. Um, I mean, you have to really trust your tester. And, and the tester can kind of just say, like, ah, I don't see anything. Um, the assembly phase, which, you know, any interface in a system where two more components are gathered together is a potential Trojan insertion site. Um, so that's trouble. And then here on the left, over in the B area, you have um, the abstraction level, which that's where the alterations actually occur, right? Um, so you have the system level, uh, which you can change ASCII values, right? You can so like a lowercase a can become a lowercase b. That's just a simple addition, right? On the ASCII table, because it's all numbers to letters and stuff. Then there's the development environment, where your Trojans are inserted into the CAD model, so you can mask Trojans. That's kind of like the testing phase, but a kind of different view of that. There's the RTL, or the register transfer level. Um, you can do some stuff there. Same with the gate level and the physical level, you can you can really kind of mess things up with just the physical interface, like the, the clock, grid, and metal uh, wires and the chip, that can cause clock skew, and a lot of programs depend on that clock. Um, so what is their experimental preparation? So they used past research data, and then they also used um, New York University. So I like to think of that as just basically free labor, uh, which I think a lot of interns and university students tend to be. Um, so they leverage that student involvement with incentives. You know, it can be food, it can be free hardware like this FPGA or <clears throat> money or a scholarship. So they were given a Xilinx Spartan 3 keyword input in the video um, port output and they had goals. They had to leak uh, a key, get some plain text out or create a denial of service attack. So what were some of the outcomes of that? Well, they determined that the activation methods 59, the majority of percent were user input, and that was typically just a single key being activated, or uh, in other cases, multiple keys. Um, the other ones, 34% were just always on. That's pretty simple. And then 4% were time bombs. Over a certain period of time, we'll start doing stuff. And the remaining were from physical conditions, like a temperature exceeding a certain point. Uh, and what were the effects? Well, half of them tended to be altered system behavior, uh, which I talked about. 36% were leaked information, and the remaining 14 tended to be denial of service. Uh, just different conditions. <clears throat> so we're some later to work. Well, I had some trouble when I was looking at this. Um, there's a lot in hardware security, but very little in hardware Trojans. Um, so <clears throat> I skimmed through the abstracts and conclusions of these papers, and the first one was uh, talking about IC Trojan detection uh, with multiple invasion side channel measurements. Uh, the second one was talking about disabling or defeating hardware security and encryption. Um, this third paper here talked about construction Trojan models. And then lowering the cost of testing, because that's a big concern, right? you got to have testing, but you got to be cost-effective. Um, the fourth one here is the characteristics of gates in terms of leakage current, switching power, and delay. 
So that was uh, something as well. <clears throat> so what are some future works? I'm kind of I'm blazing through this, but I'm trying to meet a time requirement. Um, this is such an in-depth field, and there's so much that's already occurred being so new. But at the same time, this paper identified a lot of potential Trojans that haven't really been seen in the real world, but could potentially happen. So again, be proactive. We gotta prepare for the future and be ready for this whenever it does happen. So they identify a list here of a few, 11 different types or 12 different types of things um, of potential Trojans. And so I think that is a great starting point for future work is going and identifying each of those and being prepared for that. <clears throat> so what's the big conclusion from this paper? I mean, it is a very relatively new field, um, and then there's much work to be done. You got they've done the detection mitigation protection techniques for some, but they need to do more. And then um, that proactive defense, right? A best defense is a good offense, so we need to be proactive and do more work on this. And the final thing I'd like to say is the collectively that Trojan taxonomy is just a great resource when you take advantage of that. Thanks.